Tensions remain high in Democratic Republic of Congo as riot police patrol the streets and officials finalize results from last week's presidential election. Opposition supporters say they'll protest if the current leader, Laurent Kabila, is declared the winner. More than a dozen were killed and a hundred seriously wounded in election violence, according to Human Rights Watch. U.S. officials are watching this election closely. So are corporations with interest in extracting cobalt, copper, diamonds, and other minerals that could be worth trillions of dollars. To learn more about U.S. and corporate interests in the region, the Real News Network's Paul Jay spoke to Kambali Musavuli, student coordinator and national spokesperson for Friends of the Congo. He started by asking Musavuli about a 2006 bill sponsored by then-Senators Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton that stated that U.S. policy would hold accountable individuals, entities, and countries working to destabilize the country. So Senator Obama now introduced a bill to deal with the political situation in the Congo and in the region, especially in Central Africa. He knew it was important to have leverage for nationalists destabilizing the Congo to hold them accountable for their actions in the Congo, specifically Rwanda and Uganda. So he created the bill, put pressure in Senate, got senators to co-sponsor it, and he even was really, really hard on uh, George Bush. So for example, as he passed the bill, uh, when he was signing to law, he sent a letter to Condoleezza Rice in 2007 to find out what are the updates. Now, what is the State Department of State doing? When Joseph Kabila, the president of the Congo, visited the, uh, the U.S. in 2007 to meet with George Bush, he sent a personal letter to George Bush reminding him that we have a law in the books that you need to enforce. Yet, now, nothing is being done. Why is this very important? Rwanda and Uganda invaded the Congo twice. 1996 and 98, and have unleashed uh, the conflict that's existing and causing all these deaths. If the U.S. can hold the uh, perpetrators, the negative forces on the eastern part of Congo, accountable for what's happening, peace will come very fast. But right now, the United States government has not been bold about doing so. Why? Rwanda and Uganda are U.S. allies in the war on terror. So right now, we have Ugandan troops in Afghanistan, in Iraq, we have random troops in Darfur in peacekeeping missions for the UN, so the US is not willing to hold them accountable. As it's been documented by the United Nations Group of Experts, by Human Rights Watch, by Global Witness, a very notable organization about the destabilization effort from these two nations, the US government up until today is not willing to let go of Rwanda and Uganda in the destabilization effort inside of the Congo. Now, let's go back a bit, because this kind of use of Rwanda and Uganda by the United States is nothing new in this yes. alliance. It goes right back to the time even of the overthrow of Patrice Lumumba. Yes, the U.S. has been engaged in the Congo actually for the past 100 years. You know, the United States was the first country to recognize the Congo as the personal property of Leopold allowing Leopold II of Belgium a hundred years ago to control a land the size of Europe and causing the death of almost uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 million Africans. Okay, well, let me just, for younger people that may not know this, uh, King Leopold actually got Europe, countries of Europe to agree that he could actually personally own the Congo, and he actually did for, I, I'm not, how long did, did that last? About, uh, we say, 15, 15 to 20 years. And this was essentially to exploit rubber. Exactly, rubber. And uh, not, not only rubber, they were giving access uh, to the land of the Congo to some of the American investors. So you have the Rockefellers who did receive some lands there and, uh, and a few other families that I can't remember the, the name on top of my head who stopped getting concessions of the land. So your point here is that the United States is the first country to recognize Leopold could own a country. Exactly. And with that... Um, political move with uh, the U.S. Um, leadership, other nations also recognize that. So if the United States did not recognize, Lopo would have had a hard time controlling a land that he never even visited, you know, the size of the whole continent of Europe. So, Let me just add one other note. One of the great campaigners against that in the United States was Mark Twain, actually, yes, yes. which is a note people don't know much about Twain, but uh, this part of Twain's life. But Twain was a big campaigner against Leopold and, and the, uh, his control of the Congo. Exactly, and um, that's why I say that he used his talent as a writer to not remain silent. We're not seeing that now with what's happening in the Congo, that people are not being bold. You know, I say, who are the Mark Twains of today to denounce U.S. foreign policy toward the region? Mark Twain did that back then. 
That was the Real News Network's Paul J speaking to friends of the Congo spokesperson Kambale Musavuli. To listen to the full multi-part interview, go to therealnews.com.